So before I write to the emergency, we already know that the, we call a patient that in, in a severe condition, and if not, we have, while they are stabilizing the patient, that we are uh, preparing everything. So 10 minutes to decompress the patient that are inside is not trouble. Yes, in case of this happen. Yes. Okay. The, uh, I was telling you before, we are treating around 30 pathologies that are approved by the European uh, Hyperbaric uh, uh, Society. And also, we follow also guidelines from the, uh, uh, the Association and, and United States, the Undersea Hyperbaric uh, Society as well. Um, I was telling you, we use uh, Norwegian, US, and uh, in the time I had been here, we did don't we did not have the need to use our comics or, or UK. We mainly use the Norwegian in, at the moment. Okay, our service, a part of the emergency, I was telling you. Also, we do uh, some tests, narcotics tests for uh, the firefighters or the police who are going to start a uh, diving uh, 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 course. So they are coming before to start to make a narcosis test. Also, we are certified uh, to give a fitness uh, certification to dive. And uh, some investigation also, we can give uh, some advice if uh, some this is required. To us and uh, we often also are giving lectures uh, like like this time uh, we are giving to other in other other person other stuff so the mainly effect of uh, what the chamber do in uh, in the case of uh, diving uh, sickness diving accident is that the bubbles that form you know, because of the nitrogen that uh, are to reduce the diameter of the bubble. So will help to this uh, uh, circulation to flow. So it won't damage the, the mainly tissue that uh, uh, the nitrogen uh, affect like uh, the neurological si uh, uh, system like the, the brain or the spinal, that that's why uh, when some accidents, uh, diving accidents, it might produce uh, paralysis or, or things like that. Also, we ha it, it, the hyperbaric treatment, it helps to reach the hemoglobin. Uh, normally, uh, in the one atmosphere, of course, we always uh, have, are saturated with oxygen, bound with the hemoglobin, I'm talking, I know I'm talking uh, some uh, term, medical term, but uh, I'm trying to, to not that heavy. And the, but the most important thing for the hyperbaric treatment is that not just the uh, hemoglobin is, is bound to the uh, oxygen, also the plasma. So that uh, is a mechanism that uh, this oxygen that our body needs uh, for different kind of mechanism uh, physiologically uh, can reach to the uh, hypoxic tissue when the, when there is uh, some trauma or or uh, some chronic food for, for example we see we have uh, many patient diabetic food that they have a chronic wound that don't heal so fast so uh, this is uh, the main mechanism of the hyperbaric uh, treatment uh, but the biochemical or molecular effect about what I was telling before is uh, simulate the, the, healing, the healing process because it, it reached this oxygen and uh, it, to, it improved our natural uh, immunologic system to work and help us to heal and also bacteriostatic, uh, vascular, uh, grow uh, because make a new uh, vessels when it needs and also uh, in uh, some patient we have many patients of this uh, kind when has necrosis 
of the of the femur or or the jaw after uh, when they go to Kisla method. So those kind of patient and it's very useful. We are very happy to help this kind of, of patient that improve their quality life apart of uh, in case of some accident uh, that to help. So now changing the medical part. So now you will change your mind and you will imagine that you are already check your uh, equipment. You have your tank, you check your tank, everything. So you are ready with the suit. So now thinking in that you are ready to dive. So you always have to think what can happen. It's, of course, it's fun to die, but always be aware what can happen. And there are different, uh, so we are going to give a guide what to do and how to do in case of different accident happen. And there are uh, diff, uh, four scenarios that uh, a diver can have an accident. And it can be because of the pressure or because of the marine life, some animals uh, that are dangerous for the human, uh, the gases that you are using, or if it's some uh, intoxicated or, or how to say, contaminate gas that you are using, and or the environment, uh, uh, if it's some, uh, something uh, that is in your path, or the, how do you say Korean? The drift is too strong so all those things as scenarios you have to have in mind what to do and now leonardo will dive with you and tell you what to do in this those four scenarios that you have to always have remember things today when you finish this uh, speech so there are so many things, but we don't have time to explain everything because it would be here one year of class. <laughs> but I put few of them in a different color, which are the ones I will remark today. And this one, it gets my attention in Iceland, heat shock. But we will talk about this because it's not as uh, uncommon as you think. And uh, of course, this presentation, I would like uh, to make it interactive. If you, uh, there is something you want to know or add, or there is something you think is out of what you are expecting, just let me know and we can fix and change and talk. The idea is that you get with uh, the information that you're looking for today. So let's start uh, with these four that I have here. And I classify them right now in a different type. So the first is, we're going to see these four are descent um, problems that we can find. Is narcosis, high pressure, nervous syndrome. Have you heard about this before? Yes. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about this. It's uncommon, but not many people know about this. We're going to talk a little bit about hypoxia. This week, like three days ago, two small kids died in a pool with a dive tank. You heard about yes. that because of this. So we are going to talk about this. And also, I'm going to speak a little bit about altralgia. It's like a pain joint when you're going down on the dive. It's very uncommon, but nobody knows about it almost. It's very rare. So it's good that we can just mention it right now. Narcosis is related 100% to the partial pressure of nitrogen. Let's say we have air, the air is almost 79% of nitrogen. It's an inert gas that our body do not use. It's like a waste or a mechanism of transport the oxygen. And this pressure related with the pressure that we are diving is going to make the narcosis to appear. The narcosis is called the Martini effect because it is related or you can compare it when having one martini each 10 meters of depth and i guess that you all have heard about this in your open water course if you want to read a little bit more on this because it's a big subject it's a science that is not well known these days you can read about mayor overton 
uh, on internet. It's not easy reading, but if you are the guy into numbers, math, and what's behind all this, uh, you can uh, go ahead and look about Mayer Overton lipid dilution of inner cash. So it's related about nitrogen in the lipids or the fat tissues that we have. Why is not uh, night? Um, let me put here. I'm sorry. Why is narcosis dangerous? You tell me. <laughs> they are diving almost 41 meters deep in that condition. Do you think it's a safe practice? No. Of course not. She has no idea where she is. <laughs> And it's a lot of work for the other divers that are there. It's very stressful. If there is a drift or a descending current, it will be very dangerous. So this is why narcosis is something that definitely we should care about. But then how do we deal with narcosis? I'm sorry that I have two presentations, but this is live and it's recorded, so it can be shared on the club for the other guys. What can we do with narcosis? Well, just reduce the amount of nitrogen in the gas we are going to breathe. And then is where the nitrox work is coming to us. So how do I reduce the nitrogen? Well, by adding a little bit more of oxygen. High pressure nervous syndrome is only a descent problem. We only are going to see this when we are going down and is related to very deep dives. We are talking about 120 meters depth, meters of salt water, and is also related to mixtures with only helium and oxygen, what is called heliox. Have you heard about technical divers around here? They sit together. So what they discovered is that if you add in this mix a little bit of nitrogen, what we do not want because of narcosis is a protection factor to reduce or avoid the high pressure nervous syndrome. What does it look like? It's not exactly like this, but it looks like this. I just tried to find a video on YouTube. So it's just a tremor. It's just like a muscle contraction, involuntary muscle contraction, mostly on the extremities, hands and feet. So when you're going down, you don't feel any pain, but your hands maybe start like this. What can you do? Change the gas to something with a little bit of nitrogen or just uh, slow down the descent speed. This will take out the tremor and you have no problem. You can continue your dive. It's not an actual emergency, but it could be an emergency because if you do not control, then you can get a seizure under the water. And a seizure under the water is very likely to produce a drowning. That is the danger of a seizure under the water. With hypoxia, we have the problem that if we are doing technical diving or rebreather diving, and we choose the wrong mix of breathing, and I take a mixture with an hypoxic gas, then I will not have the enough oxygen that I need, and I will just die like suffocated. Okay? This is what happened to the kids on the pool. I have not written the news, the complete news, because it's something very recent, but it was like they were all together in family and there was a scuba diving tank and they put them there for the kids to play on the pool and the tank had less than 9% of oxygen in the mixture. So they died in a pool, in a party. Uh, analtrasia is just a joint pain that we can get during the descent and it's related to the liquid that we have in our joints. When we have two bones, it's like a lubrication for the joints and we have this liquid and the diffusion of gases in this liquid is very slow. It's the slowest tissue in the body to get an equilibrium with the gases. So because of this change of speed in the diffusion, we can get pain. What do we have to do? slow the descent speed. That is only the only thing we need to do. And it's related between dives at 90 or more than 180 meters depth. So nothing that I think we should worry about here in Iceland. Then we talked about a little bit of uh, 
how to reduce narcosis by increasing the oxygen level, but then we have oxygen toxicity also. Uh, why is not this a presentation? Okay. We have also the oxygen toxicity because the oxygen is toxic with the pressure. And we have to, it's something that we deal every day with the chamber. We do some calculations and some gases when we have emergencies to avoid this and be in the safe side all the time. It's related to three things for rebreather drivers. Partial pressure of oxygen, the time of exposure, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. This is very important. So if you have a problem in the chemical of the rebreather, it's very likely to have an oxygen toxicity because it's a closed uh, process that it will target once again itself. So it's going to be bigger every time. We can go in deeper another time in this subject for you. The risk of an oxygen toxicity is drowning because they, what it will produce is a seizure under the water. Have you seen this before? Uh, can I ask one question about the seizures? Sure. When a person has a seizure under water, does it bite like down on the regulator or is the mouth open or does it vary? Depends. Depends. It's different, but most likely is that he will bite the regulator and he will bite so hard that maybe he will uh, break his tooth, break the regulator. He can drown with the rubber part of the regulator. Also, it can get stuck here on the regulator. It's very difficult to manage a seizure under the water. So I think the only safe would be a full face mask, but uh, it has pros and contras. So okay. it's very known, the limits of oxygen exposure. So if you uh, keep in those safety limits, you will not have a problem with that. But with a full face mask, yes. you will have a seizure and then it just won't wake up and not. If you have a seizure, then the buoyancy is on risk. Okay. Uh, you get loss on orientation, so but at least how, you're how not going to... How long will it take you to recover? Like, under water. If you keep on that gas, the seizure will stay there. So the thing you need and the assistance you need is to reduce the partial pressure of oxygen by taking out the oxygen from the diver. So you take another mixture or you dilute the rebreather or you just give them air if you are breathing oxygen or nitrox. You have to change the regulator. It's not easy under the water. But once you take out the oxygen, it's a matter of seconds that the seizure will stop. And it has no any sequela for the diver. Also in the chamber, if we put a lot of oxygen in the chamber, we will get a seizure on the patient. But that seizure, when you take out the mask, it will go out in seconds. Okay, and this is a video that they made, and it's very nice how they, it's a simulation, but it's very uh, good, so you can more or less have an idea of how it looks. The diver comes and puts another regulator. This is not like this in real, because you cannot just take out one regulator, open your mouth and put the other one, but it's not that easy. But as I told you, it's very well known the limits of the oxygen. So I actually put them here. Depend on the agency and the training agency, it changed a little bit. But for bottom gas is 1.4 and for the compression is 1.6. That, that means that you can maximum breathe pure oxygen until six meters depth. That is the limit for that. On the water, of course, it depends on the condition of the dive, if it's cold water, altitude diving, if you have many equipment, you have to reduce this also. For you to have an idea, in the hyperbaric chamber, we bring this number up to three, which is the limit to get a seizure. But it's a different environment. It's no exercise, no equipment, no water, no risk of drowning. It's a doctor or a nurse with a patient. And the benefit for this is greater than the risk. So if we do not do it, it's going to be worse for the patient. And then we can use also medications to avoid the seizure. So it's a different environment. Uh, are there many stories of like survival stories where, the, where a body has uh, managed to get uh, an, another regulator into the mouth of a seizure? I have not heard about it. I've never heard any. No. <laughs> yes.
So, so, but they, I mean, they teach the skill, but yes, but there's no confirmation that it ever worked. No. During a seizure, you cannot open the mouth of no. a person. At the, at but you, you will take in water during the seizure. Probably, yes. What you can do if you see a diver with a seizure under the water and he has his regulator on the mouth, is just holding his head and hold the regulator in place, the one he has, and maybe push the uh, push button to ensure a lot of air and take out any possible water from coming in the air. That is the best that you can do. So, di partner diving, very near, is the most secure for this. But as I told you, this is very easy to avoid. Just keep below those numbers. It's very easy. Good questions about this one. So about the number that you go all the way up to three uh, yes. in a hyperbolic chamber. I mean, there's nothing different between the physics of uh, the chamber and the water. It's just the uh, added security of uh, all the people around and uh, uh, preparation. The physics is just the same. What it's changed that all these things are tar targeted also by the task and the effort that the diver is doing if there is a very strong drift under the water a current and i need to be swimming i will produce more co2 so this is going to trigger the oxygen toxicity but inside the chamber the diver is just there with a very comfortable pillow in a bed in a good temperature with a iv probably with fluids and medication to avoid the seizure so it's a we can allow to go very near to these uh, levels. So CO2 triggers uh, oxygen toxicity? Yes. So but, uh, this is a very complex subject, but to make it uh, resume, the oxygen is uh, stimulating the nervous system, mainly the brain, okay? So what CO2 do, does, it does three principal mechanisms, but the most important is that it makes a vasodilatation of the arteries and veins in the brain. So this makes that the high amount of oxygen that I have already in my bloodstream is going to reach very easy the brain, which is the nervous tissue that is the target or the most sensitive for the oxygen uh, toxicity. So that is one of the things. Then it's going to uh, make the blood a little bit more acid and this is gonna lead to the oxygen get out of the hemoglobin faster because the blood is a little bit more acid and that makes a biochemical process that the oxygen that is carried in the blood is easily going to go out of the blood and go to another tissues. So I have three different mechanisms why these high amounts of oxygen are gonna reach the brain. So Actually, CO2 is the most important uh, part on this process. So that's why do not use reuse the scrubber because oh, this is okay for eight hours. No. So Just like, like some some units like Revo, yeah. they have like dual scrubbers, so you, yes. you switch the cassette from yes. one out. Uh, you use you die for Revo? <laughs> yes. Okay. I do not share that uh, technology, but of course it's made for that. Okay. But the scrubber has a lifetime and volume of liters that it can filter for say that it's two process that the scrubber does. And I don't want to get uh, very much out of this, but uh, if you have a scrubber that you have breathed eight hours on it and you put it again because it was the second part of the scrubber, it already has eight hours of filtration. So are you going to rely your life in one kilo of softener? No. I will prefer to put it in the trash and put fresh. Depends on the type of dive you're doing also. If you're doing shallow dive, 10, 12 meters, it's okay because if you feel something strange, you can just bail out and go to the surface. But if you're doing a cave dive where you are four hours inside the cave, and you know that you cannot go to the surface in four hours, then I will think twice. And if you have a rebreather, you can pay a little bit more of a scrub. <laughs> the, the, the soft no lime you use, 
it, it, the manifold softener lamp. Does it have like color coloring or uh, no? I use diamond softener lamp for me. Oh, and but the, the one we use here yeah. is different. It's not the same. Okay. It's a different, uh, the same brand, the same mechanism, but the pellet is different. Okay. It's bigger, but because it's not made for work on the pressure, and it's color coded, so we can see in the anesthetic machine when it color it changes color. But that color is only when you are breathing with the scrub. So if you finish your dive and you take it out. Probably that purple color is going to be half of what it real is in real. You have to be breathing to see the color. Okay. Okay. So, have you ever done this question for you? Which is the best gas for diving? Yes, we have talked about reduce the nitrogen, put the oxygen, but the oxygen is toxic. The nitrogen is narcotic. So, which is the best gas? Yeah. So I have here. Each dive is unique and must be planned as so. And who says this? <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> so you make your own quotes. <laughs> Each dive is different. I am different. You are different. Maybe I have more fat tissue than you, and I'm more propensed of having a uh, decompression illness than you. So uh, the best class is the one that gives me this. Target bottom and time, so I can reach the bottom, uh, the depth and the time I want for the dive. Is the one that gives me a good mental performance to do that dive. Is the one that reduces the risk for me of getting any decompression illness. Is the one that I have in a redundant configuration, like here. Uh, is meant for specific conditions. Okay, for example, if I am breathing a lot of helium. I have to be careful with my body temperature because the helium is going to cool me down very fast. So I need a very isothermic protection in my suit. Uh, it's the one that can allow me to perform the task I need. It's not the same to go diving to look some fish than going to fix an uh, oil pipe under the water. Uh, logistics, are the logistics available? So this is something very important also. What the type of dive are you going to do and find the place that can give you the service for this? Also, the configuration and the training that you have for that. It's not like, oh, I need this gas, so I will do it. No, you need the training and you need all this to use this gas. So the correct answer is there is not the perfect gas. That quote was good, isn't it? <laughs> 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 So, a little bit of classification of gases, and uh, if you're not very into this subject, just let me know and we will go a little bit faster, but I put here in yellow, like, the limit depths for it, a few basic classification of the gases, and more or less the percentage of oxygen in this gas. So, we can take about, for diving, oxygen, and it will be considered anything that has more than 95% that it will consider like pure oxygen for us. And we can maximum breathe it to six meters. Any hyperoxic mixture, hyper is more than, so it's more oxygen than the one we have in the ambient atmosphere. So any gas that has more than 22% of oxygen, it's going to be called hyperoxic. Normoxic is any gas that has between 18 and 21% oxygen in the mixture because we can breathe 18% of oxygen in the surface and nothing is going to happen. Hypoxic is going to be considered between 10 and 17%, and below this is going to be anoxic gas. And it's rarely used, but it's actually what killed these two kids in the pool three, four days ago. And anoxic gas, these gas are used to dive more than 125 meters. When you're doing a dive like this, then you need not only one tank, because you probably will need them all for one dive. So how do you do this? We divide then the gases in four different stages. We have the bottom gas, that is the gas that we are going to mainly use going down during my whole dive and until my first uh, safety or decompression stop that I plan on my dive. It's in blue. 
Then we will have the decompression of this gas. Depends on the pressure, on the depth. I'm gonna choose an anoxic, hypoxic, or anoxic gas. For example, I'm going to do a dive at 50 meters. Then I can choose an hyperoxic mixture. For example, 50 meters, I will choose nitrox 24%. But then going up, I will uh, I would want a uh, gas with more oxygen, so that the compression is faster, is better, and less time under the water. So then I need to take out my regulator and put another tank, another different mixture, another regulator in my mouth. This probably will be a hyperoxic mixture. It would be nitrox 50, nitrox 80, all depends on the type of gas. Then we have emergency gas, or what we call a bailout in the rebreather diving, that is just a gas and tanks that we do not use never. We should never use a bailout tank. But if the machine has a complete failure, I have the tanks to change to a, a normal regulator, what we call open circuit, and go safely to the surface. If we are going to do a very deep dive, that means that for one diver, maybe I need eight tanks, but I cannot carry one rebreather plus eight tanks. So we do a body uh, team sharing. So we take only gases for one emergency and we split these tanks in the whole team. So maybe uh, I am diving and I'm carrying my rebreather plus two tanks. And you have two tanks, two tanks, two tanks. So we have eight tanks. In case of an emer emergency, we all have to go together and I already know that I have tank number one, so I give you this, you breathe that. The tank is empty, you give me the empty, and I give you the other one. And we change until we go to the surface. That is how a bailout works. And the last one we have is a travel gas that normally is the same as the decompression gas. And why is this? Because if I'm doing a dive with an epoxic or anoxic gas, I cannot start my dive by breathing this gas on the surface. I will die because I have 9% or 6% of oxygen. So I need a gas to start my dive, and when I have the enough pressure to, for this mixture to be safe to breathe, then I can use it. So sometimes we start the dive with a decompression gas. I change one time. I do my complete dive. I change here, and maybe, depend on the plan, this uh, pink line is three or four different gases that I have to change in different depths to make more efficient the, the compression process. Nice work with the colors. Hmm? Good work with the colors. Uh, yeah. the <laughs> yeah. so very nice. But I will have the presentation in the... I'm going to make a link in our web page so you can download it. And uh, I will see if I can put the recording there also in the link. Okay, thank you. So because the pictures here I know is not the best. So then we already dived and we are going to the surface and we have the three main pathologies that we can find during the, uh, our way up to the surface. So the most popular is the compression illness. It's related to the speed of ascent, the time I was in the bottom, the gas I was breathing, personal susceptibility. Uh, deshydratation is very important to avoid this. Uh, fat tissue, exercise, food, sleep, drugs, alcohol, smoke, all these are factors for personal susceptibility and the dive profile. If I dive with a very aggressive dive profile or I want to put my computer in a very aggressive decompression model, I probably will have the compression fields. And the message that I want to give you today is that this is not an exact science. You can have 20 computers, different brands, different models, and they all are going to tell you, oh, your decompression is done. You are okay to go to the surface. And you can get a decompression illness because it's not an exact science. Are all these days, 2021, theories that have not been proved? There are some, oh, this is better than this one, but it's just like theories, and this is since many years ago. Um, what can we feel? This is very important for you to know when you can have a decompression illness. So the first thing is very unspecific. So it's not a correct answer for this neither. 
you can have a headache, you can have pain on the joints, you can have just uh, skin um, spots like this, it's called cutis marmorata. It's just like skin rush, but in a purple color. But it's very different. Maybe you get one type and I get one different. And all this is going to be related where those bubbles are. When you're going up, the bubbles of nitrogen or inert gases can expand. And depends where those bubbles are is what I'm going to manifest or my condition as a patient it would be. For example, if those bubbles are in the heart, I'm going to feel like I have a heart attack. Yes, it's a heart attack, but it's because of the bubbles. So first of all, well, I will show you what we do with the divers on the hospital. It's a very complex diffusion. I just want to mention it because it's a very complex subject, but it's related to helium and nitrogen dive. So very deep dive when I use this type of special gases. And it's because the helium and the nitrogen, they have different speeds of diffusion. So they are going to be fighting which one goes in, which one goes out. And in this fight, there are some tissues in the body that are going to carry a very high uh, amount of inert gas. And it's going to produce a decompression illness. So this is actually the same clinic, the same condition, and the same treatment for the compression illness. And this is uh, thorax hyperpressure syndrome. It's related to pressure, basically. And this is when we do not follow the first law of diving, which is? Always keep breathing. Always keep breathing. If you hold your breath, if you hold your breath, at 1.2 meters of depth, and you go to the surface, is there enough pressure to make a hole or uh, break the tissues inside your lungs? And this will carry that bubbles of air will go to the artery system. They can go to the brain, to the heart, to the uh, any place in the, in the body. But also the blood can come out there and block the pul the, the lungs, the pulmonary system, okay? So this is very difficult to manage. For example, here, well, you cannot see it very good, but when you download the presentation, you're gonna see better. There are some dark spots here, and this is air. The air just escaped from the lungs and went under the skin to the neck. So it was like two bubbles of air here. And this is just escaped from the lungs because of pressure, one and two meters. So, oh, snorkel is okay, there is no risk. Hey, be careful, because with snorkel you can get this. I think uh, here with all the dry suit that you need and all the buoyancy, you don't have <laughs> that ring. I think it's very difficult to reach 1.2 meters here, but uh, it's very important that you never hold your breath when dying, okay? Is, is the isobaric uh, concrete diffusion connected with the, the uh, it's called the oxygen window? Or mm -hmm. like, no. This is mainly related to helium and nitrogen. Because when you are on the way up, you're changing gases, you want to reduce and take out helium. But if you change and you take the wrong tank or the wrong regulator and you take more helium, the helium is going to go inside your tissues faster than the nitrogen can come out. So you will have a lot of nitrogen, which already you have in, and you are changing to a gas that is likely to get more inert gas faster than the one you can bring out. So then you're having a decompression illness at the same depth. So I can be diving 20 minutes at 40 meters, and just because I change of gas, I can have a sudden uh, the compression illness without changing the pressure. Oh, but the saturation is different from tissues, like fat is very fast, yes. bone is slow. Yes, that depends on the model you want to see, but uh, which I like the most is uh, Bullman model, which is 16 different compartments where we divide the tissues, and each compartment has a different speed of diffusion of gases. So, yes. Pullman, does it look at like fat tissue and, and, and bone tissue? And bone yes, it, it's grouped because we have many tissues. So we ju he just grouped, oh, this is similar to this, so this is going to be group one. 
This one and this one is more or less the same. It's going to be group two. So the group is actually divided by the similarity in the diffusion of gases from each tissue. But it's called the half times of uh, yes. saturation. And then this is a combined, uh, let's say, pathology that we can see going down, but we also can see going to the surface. This is very exaggerated images. I choose on the internet for you today. Uh, but what the message I want to go with this is that if you do not pay attention to this, you can get this serious. So you can get barotrauma in any space of the body that is hard, uh, is inside the bone or is in a hard um, space. Like the sinus we have in our face, the teeth when I have a caries or a dental procedure inside and I left a small bubble of air inside the teeth, it can explode or implode. On the middle ears is the most uh, common that we know when we do not compensate properly. Then we have the mask uh, barotrauma is the two pictures that we have. This can be very serious. And we have the dry suit barotrauma. I don't know if you can see very well this, but it's very similar to the decompression illness spots in the skin. But the way we can differentiate if it's decompression illness or a barotrauma from the dry suit is by looking the how do you call this in a cloth? The, no, not the sleeve, like when you are yes. seams. The, seams. the seams. If you should see that the pattern of this is the same pattern of the seams of the dry suit, then you can automatically discard the compression illness. So this is why it is very important to always bring the equipment with the patient if possible. Of course, you're not going to all wait the ambulance because we need to go. <laughs> but for us, for example, it's very important the dive computer because the first thing we are going to ask is what was the dive profile? And if you have spots in this, we will want to see the dry suit and compare the seams of the dry suit with the marks on the skins from you. Uh, one question about the dive computer. Like, uh, do you have all cables, all mm -hmm. software for... Uh, no, no, no. no. We have so you just look into the computer cell. Yes. Yes. We don't we, have these. They are so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are made. Yeah. <laughs> and we do not have to operate all of them. No, we just no. uh, familiar with few yes. of them. Yeah. But uh, if the diver is there, we can for sure he can show it to us. And well, if he is in a very. Who knows this computer? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I use that. Right, many technical diving friends that have. You know, their fillings are popped. Or one of them is filling is exploded. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you can imagine. Like, but this is very easy to avoid also because when you're going down in two meters, you will feel the discomfort already. All the squeeze. Yes. It will be uncomfortable and stick to me. So if you really want to push that, you are going to feel a very severe pain before you get to this point. With the dry suit, it's not that bad because then you, okay, I, I, for example, when I use, I hate the dry suit, but when I use it, I like it to be like very tight. So always when I go out, I am a little bit like this. But because I like, I do not like my dry suit to be like floating all around. But this can happen. But to get this is, I mean, this I have never mask. seen this. This is from a mask. Screen. Yes. Okay. And how easy is this that you just blow a little bit through your nose? So, so she did not equalize her mask and he did not uh, equalize his three parts of the yes. Probably it's people without training that they go diving and they just think that it's normal. It's normal to feel that and they just social pressure. This is very likely to see in the uh, girlfriends of the divers. <laughs> because they push so much they, their girlfriends to go diving and they are so nervous and it's something they don't want to do but they are just doing because oh my boyfriend wants me to dive so they don't pay attention to the course they go diving and they come out like this just to impress his boyfriend and this how many of you well you all uh, dive on tricep right do you use p-valve yes no yes no Magali? 
What, what Diapers to how do you make pee when you have your dress? No, no. Just zipper. Do you never pee? I, I, I don't pee when I'm in the dress. No? no? Okay. Five points for you. <laughs> so, but you know what is a pee valve? Have you heard about the pee valve? It's just an attachment we put in the dry suit so we can make pee. The dry suit is dry. We have no water. So, if we pee inside, we are going to have pee all over our body. Lovely. Oh, the, the, the smell later is <laughs> you have to throw it to the dry suit. It's comfortable. We can wear a diaper. <laughs> some, some people wear diapers. Right? Yes, sometimes you can use a diaper. But for example, in my case, I pee all the diaper. <laughs> so I need to change diaper like four times in front. <laughs> so I install the pee valve and it's a miracle. It's very nice. What is a problem with the pee valve? I'm not promoting this, but uh, this is a problem for the compression illness. And why? First, you have the squeeze, the P valve squeeze, which I do not suggest. So, if you buy a P valve, buy a balanced P valve. It's, they have a special valve, so the pressure inside is the same outside, because if not, the pressure and the squeeze is going to be in your penis. Okay? And it's going to be very <laughs> traumatic. <laughs> oh, you can have problems with that. So, balance P valve always. What is the problem with this? If you do not have a pee valve in your dry suit, of course you do not want to pee while dying. What do you do when you do not want to pee? You stop drinking water. And dehydration is one of the most important things to avoid or to produce the compression pill. So if I have a pee valve, I will be sure that I can drink plenty of water and be in a good condition to perform that dive. I can have a better decompression because if I have not a, a pee valve and I have a diaper and the diaper is full of pee, then I will have pain and oh, okay, and maybe you skip dive stops or safety stops or you just go to the surface or it can be a problem in these deep dives. You can do longer dives because any diaper can take four or five or six hours of diving. And you have no hurry for your dive, so you will enjoy your dive with a pivot. You have recently also, uh, for the woman, it's called a she pee, <laughs> something like that. And this is the male catheter for the guy. The other problem is what they try to avoid is because this has a, like a paste inside, it's a sticky, like a sticky condom. But you can have them without the sticky. Yeah, but then it goes out under the suit. So you need to buy with the sticky. But then it's very painful to take it out. So that's another reason why pe people hate the pivot. So what I want today is to show you a trick how to use this with the paste without having pain. First of all, you have to shave very well down there. Okay? No hair. So this goes to the woman also. I'm going to simulate with a condom. But it's very no, nice. You can help me, my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come here. All you need is a little bit of toilet paper. So this male catheter will have paste almost in all the condom. But you only need a little bit to make it stay there. So what you can do is protect your penis with toilet paper around it. OK? and just slide the male catheter, it will stick in the first five millimeters of skin, and then you can unroll the rest, and the, all the paste is gonna be in the toilet paper. So you are not going to struggle with all these sticky things that is very painful. And it's the main reason why people avoid the piva. So here you have a trick, so you can safely enjoy your diet. So you recommend? <laughs> I definitely recommend this with a paste, with a balanced pivot. Thank you, Ulton. Thank you, Ulton. Thank you, Ulton. Ah, that's what they are doing. Or is it Ulton? So they can buy it? Of course. Yes. We use it for old people. Yes. Old men. And last this one maybe is a little bit more difficult to find because it's a new thing. It just came to the I'm market. Not seen that. No, I could have been using it for years. 
Sorry? I think it's been used in, used in hiking for years. Oh, in hiking? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and don't have to, like, you know, in like mm -hmm. climates. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't. With the uh, uh, CD, uh, the word is that uh, it actually works uh, fine. Okay, uh, I have not tried that. But it's just like, uh, yeah. it's uh, easier for us men to uh, connect. Yes. But I definitely recommend this is something I will invest in. My, I mean, my dry suit dive changed before and after a pivot. Yeah. And Completely. the dehydration of, uh, you know, uh, this is very important. People do this uh, when they're going for a long time, they uh, skip from the drinking part. Yes. And this, uh, when I'm doing deeper or longer dives or cave diving, for example, I take under my uh, the BCD, I take a camelback with at least two or three liters of water. So I have my hose and I can, during the dive, the decompression, I can drink water all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that I have this, so I can, it's water in, water out. I'm very well hydrated, so I am, my mind is out of worrying about the decompression sickness or uh, whatever can happen after. So this is just like to mention, but it's the first aid we should do in Iceland. This is for you in Iceland. In the web page also, I will put the link of this. It's some like uh, basic information of, with our email and what to do in Iceland, okay? It's in uh, like five or different six languages. The first thing we need to do is call 112 and tell them we have a dive emergency. They have a special procedure for that. And they activate the hospital, they call the ambulance, they call the Coast Guard, they call also this a complete established procedure for this. If you have time, if you have more people in scene, you can do a scene evaluation. So you can see what happened. You, your safety goes first also. If you're going to help the person, your safety is more important than the other person. Because if not, it's going to be two injuries instead of one. Many people looking around is a mess, but if you use them on your favor, please, you call the ambulance and come back and tell me what he told. Magali, please, put these people away. You, please, bring me a towel. You call, then everybody has a paper, and they are going to do something to help you, but not just be there posting a video, taking photos, or very common these things. Important, the quick. Equipment. We will want to see, inspect the equipment after, take notes because after it, uh, many people is going to ask at what time it happened, who was in here, what did you do, and everything. So one of the people that is just looking, you can tell them, okay, write the times and the information of everyone here, and he's going to be very busy there. Uh, regarding the equipment, shouldn't you call the police to collect the equipment? I mean, you're not going to put it in the app. No, 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 no. The police is here. Okay. They for sure will call the yeah, dive team the from the police. It's a complete um, system. It's a team with members from the fire department, the police, and the Coast Guard. So they put the team all together. Okay. Then always CPR, oxygen and airway as you learn in your course. If you have time, if the ambulance is arriving but have not arrived yet, the neurologic evaluation is very important for us. So I think uh, uh, there are many agencies that have programs or you can see something in the internet, but it's very important if you have time to do this on the place, that you do a neurologic evaluation, you fill the paper the best you can. This is a very useful information for us. Many people was asking me, oh, but when it arrives and the doctor see the paper and he, oh, but this guy is not a doctor or he's not a nurse. He doesn't know how to do a neurologic evaluation. 
Yes, those are the doctors from the ER. But we know about this, and we know that you are trained to fill this form. This form is meant for any diver to fill it. And if the information there is very useful for us to treat in the channel. Uh, um, one question, sorry. Uh, is there a difference uh, in, uh, if you have a near drowning uh, diver in a shallow uh, known that it was a shallow dive or a, or a deeper dive with a chamber? Or is it just always? Dive? Yes, we. Uh, it's the next slide, but it's different. Mm -hmm. But the procedure for you is the same. Call 112, dive emergency and they will ask a few information. Where in Iceland can we buy like emergency oxygen and like a free flow regulator? Because, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But you mean like the done equipment? Yeah. Maybe you should talk to Valdi. Okay. In a uh, passport? Okay. Yes. I have one uh, like a, a tank. Uh, that I was renting from uh, Lidia. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's like twenty uh, five thousand a year rented, and we can uh, buy it uh, for fifty thousand. Yeah, so probably you need to buy the regulator as well. The the uh, first day term. Probably you need to buy the regulator, and then on Linda you can get the oxygen by itself. Okay. This we can maybe ask to. I will make some calls this week. Okay. And transport to the ER here, in this hospital, because we are the ones in charge for this. Are you interested in knowing what's happening with the diver once he arrived to the ER? Or you prefer to skip this? <laughs> Nobody wants to skip this time. <laughs> so, the diver arrived in the ambulance, or you arrived by your car to the ER. And then the ER is going to make a primary assessment. Of course, the airway, hydration, and vital signs will always come first. At this moment, probably, we are already, already going to be in the ER waiting for the diver from our department. The dive physician is going to be there for it. At this time, our task is to look the computer, analyze the case, look what was the dive profile, maybe see what was happening. We will do an another neurologic evaluation to the patient. If we consider it necessary, we can do an echocardiogram to see bubbles in the heart, and we have special skills, like to classify how bad is the, the compression illness. We can ask for some tests if we need. If we need an x-ray of the thorax, or if we need some uh, labs or blood tests, we will do that. And then immediately, without losing time here, we will go to the chamber to 18 meters and start breathing pure oxygen at 18 meters. This is the standard procedure. Once we are in 18 meters, we are going to start making decisions, depending on the condition or the improvement of the patient. If the patient stills like that 20 minutes after, if it's improving or if it's worse, then we make decisions on time. So, which is the table treatment that you use for this? First comes this. And at this moment, 20 minutes later, we will choose the proper table to apply to that diver. So if we need to go deeper, we run the chamber deeper. We can go to 55 meters, and we have the gases to do that. If the patient is susceptible to oxygen, then we put medication to avoid the seizure, and we go deeper with oxygen. If the patient cannot take any of this, we can do air saturation tables also. We have the logistics for that. It's very complex. I think we have not done that before, but we can do it. It's something that we are capable of doing saturation air tables. In and of course, we will uh, plan anything required with the diver. Probably, if the patient has a good outcome and everything comes good, we will ask for a two hours observation in the ER in a bed, and then they can go home. But sometimes they have to spend the night at the hospital. Mm -hmm. If we want to, if we want to have a neurologic evaluation each six hours or each four hours, and look at the patient's IV fluids or something, we will just require a hospitalization for 24 hours. And we can do a second echocardiogram after to compare the bubbles before and after. So. Uh... I mean, let, let's see if you have a technical diver that 
went for a 100 meter dive. He had a problem. If you could help him, like you could go to that depth. Or we will do maximum 55 meters, nothing more. But, but the chamber has been tested to 200. Yeah, the chamber is tested to 82 meters, but it's designed for 200 meters. So the windows and everything is calculated for 200 meters. Okay. The windows, which is the most, uh, uh, let's say, um, susceptible part, or the one that is, yeah, it's not steel, so it's uh, most likely yes. to, break. to break. They are yes. tested at 200 meters. So it's indeed a very secure equipment that we have here. How would you bring that diver up to 55? That's, I, I mean, it's, it's very rare now, but sometimes people do technical dives here. Yes. But how would you bring that diver up to 55? I mean, I mean the dive he's doing is going to be in the water, so he needs to go. I, I have not understood very well the question. I mean, I mean if he has like decompressive. Decompressive. Yeah. Decompressive. 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 At let's say okay, 80 meters, mm -hmm. how, how would you like bring him down? Like, oh, we do not require to go as deep as the dive. Okay. No, the okay. treatment does not go. Uh, it's not the same depth as the diver was to. Okay. We manage uh, by partial pressure and different depths. So we play with the effect of reducing the volume of the bubble with the pressure, and washing out all the inert gas with high dosage of oxygen. So, of course, we have limits for the oxygen. Uh, 18 meters is the limit for pure oxygen in the chamber. So, please never breathe oxygen deeper than 6 meters for you on the water. 18 meters, uh, it's the PO3 of, uh, of 3. Yes. Yeah. yes. Do, you, do you take oxygen breaks in the chamber? Yes, we do. Like every... Depends on the oh. table we are using, but uh, sometimes each uh, 30 minutes is the most. Well, Depends on the table. Otherwise, you start feel, feeling a burning sensation or. No, you. you know, and the limit. Far as the limit. Okay. Yes. But uh, why, why do you have to take oxygen? Because the oxygen is toxic. So, yes, we can play with some medications to avoid the seizure, but the toxicity is going to be there. So, we have to. You remember when I talked to you about the safety limits of the oxygen. So. We go to the limit, but we stay below the risk limit of the oxygen. So we touch the line, but we are not crossing the line of the limit. Have you ever had a case where somebody has a seizure in the, in the chamber? Yes, we have. And what, I mean, if you have a seizure in the chamber, is it like a, a safe? I mean... Yes, it's very safe. I mean, you won't bite your tongue or... We have all the equipment and the training for it. Okay. And it, you take out the oxygen mask and it's seconds. It's good. And we have uh, pillows to protect, so it's very uh, harmful. And uh, you get the statistics in, in, in chambers are that one or two oxygen seizures each 10,000 treatments. So it's quite, rare. it's quite rare, but we can manage. And uh, they say that if you have a hyperbaric center that have never had oxygen toxicity, you are not doing things properly. <laughs> Please yes, <laughs> you're not giving oxygen. <laughs> but no, it's uh, something, the message I want to give you is that it's very safe. And I'm giving you some, yes, 18 meters oxygen, but it's something you cannot do in the water. I do not want to go to recom in water recompression, but I do not recommend that never just in a very remote case, but not in Iceland. You don't have the conditions to do in water recompression here. And this is an agreement that we have with the Coast Guard also. Yeah. We know the procedure. We have done many uh, drills of that. We know the procedure, we have the equipment, we have the logistics for doing that. But we have many other options to do before requiring this. 
Okay, and this is just like to have an idea of the equipment itself, you already saw, but there are many different type of equipments. And I will just, I think you will be more interested in the saturation diving chambers, maybe you want to see. But the one that we have here is a recompression chamber, so it's designed to surface the compression for divers, but it's big enough and it's modified to do also outpatients uh, for many other diseases every day. So what we have here in Iceland is an hybrid between two different systems. Then we have transport chambers. It can be for one person or for two. This is very tight because it's a tube that you go like this and you cannot move. And they are designed, if you can see here, they have like a system that they can go inside a bigger cham and they chamber and they can lock. So if you have a person here, it's a transport. You can put this in an ambulance, helicopter, in an airplane, and you can go to an hyperbaric facility where you have this same connection and you just put the chamber there, you put the same pressure, and then you can open the door and put the diver from this small one in the big one without changing the pressure. The, the Coast Guard has one like this. Yes. And you got the head. Let me use it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> put the head. Yeah. But, but uh, can you connect that one to yours? No, no. Ours don't have this system. That's one of the reasons. Yeah. Yes. Um, and um, yes, this is a video. Have you heard about uh, surface decompression? So divers. Divers make a decompression profile under the water, but it's so expensive to have divers under the water doing just the compression for many hours. But they just bring them very fast to the surface. They have a lot of people in the team, so they will take out the helmet, take out the dive equipment, they will take out the clothes of the patient, they will put some fresh water, and they will just go there. I think this is for the video, but they will go naked inside the chamber in less than five minutes. So in less than five minutes, they go from the uh, depth of the dive onto the chamber to the same depth of the dive. So they do a, a slow ascent in the hyperbaric chamber. So this is surface decompression. But if the chamber has a malfunction, then they have a pretty big problem, right? Yes, yeah. but then <laughs> these chambers, they have redundant systems that oh. you cannot imagine, as we do. So we have... But there are, must be some limit of uh, how deep they go yes, on the yes. side. Yes. For this yes. Yes. And has there been any studies like on comparisons between mountain sickness and Compression yes, it's quite similar, the process, but it's different in the pressures and the treatment and everything. For example, when I put here mountain sickness, it's because these inflatable chambers are lately very, very popular in the internet. So it's like, oh, hyperbaric chambers, and it's like a, a boat material, inflatable uh, material. This is for low pressure, and it's only approved for mountain sickness because they only need a little bit of pressure for that. So the treatment is more or less the same, but I would not say you can compare it. Okay, and um, plumary edema. And you know, that's when uh, you start coughing up liquids. Like when you're climbing Yes, 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 yes. No, we no. do not have that in that. Okay. It's a completely different uh, process. Right. And uh, there are some medications to avoid that also. And this is a saturation complex. We are about to finish our presentation for today. And this is the Scambi Arctic. It's an Oregon boat, and it's the biggest saturation complex in the world. It has a big technology. It was very expensive. There is a report in National Geographic in YouTube, this one hour length, about this boat. And it's very interesting if you want to see it later. You can just look at Scandi Arctic in YouTube, and you will find it. So. This is mostly for to perform works under the water. This is more more uh, paid by the oil companies. Shell was a very big company putting money in the studies to develop these technologies. And what they do is that maybe we are talking about 300 meters depth. We are not talking about 20 or 30 meters. So what they do 
because they need a lot of divers, 300 meters, working 24 hours to fix a oil pipe or change a valve or something. So it is very expensive to take a diver down, work 20 minutes, and two days to go to the surface. So what they realize is what happened if we keep all the divers at 300 meters for one month. So they change eight hour shifts, but they are always in the same pressure. So this is a saturation complex. So it's just like this. Are different hyperbaric chambers. They have to cook, they have bathroom, they have showers, they have beds, they have spares, and they have the diving bell, which are these two. And these bells are where the divers are resting here and they are going to work. So they go to the bell. Everything is the same pressure. They lock a door down here in the bell and this can separate from the complex. And with some wires, this bell can go through a hole in the hull of the boat and can go 300 meters depth. So the divers are always at 300 meters depth. They do the work, they open the they open a door under the bell. They can go out with what they call the umbilical. It's like a, a cord that has water, gas, uh, communication, lightnings, and hot water. They do the work. They go again to the bell, and they go to the surface to rest here. But they still in 300 meters. Do they pump hot water inside the, the, the soups they have? Yes. yes. The, the umbilical is three cords they have. One is the gas they're going to breathe. The other one is electricity for communications, lights, and sometimes they can monitor the vital signs of the divers down there. And the other one, they pop very hot water at high pressure. So the suit has like small uh, hoses all around. Yeah, like spray. The, yeah. The, the suit is spraying all over the It's just like a spray. Okay. But okay. it's not wet inside. It's just like the tube is hot mm -hmm. and the tube is releasing the water outside. Okay. And one thing else, the communication has equalizer. Because of the helium, when the diver is talking, they can't understand it. So they have to equalize the voice of the diver to understand it. So they change the sound. They change the sound completely. Yeah. They, they talk like Donald Duck. <laughs> and it's difficult to understand it. So they can change the sound of the diver. And so of course. Money and noise. <laughs> And to finish, of course, is uh, a boat. They need a lifeboat, but they are 300 meters step. You can make, you need maybe 15 days to bring them to the surface, the compression. So they also have what is called a self-propelled hyperbaric lifeboat. So it is a lifeboat like this uh, here that is connected through a pipeline at the same pressure of the hyperbaric complex where they can just escape in the case they need to abandon the ship. So this boat actually, it has the place for all the divers. It has the captain of the boat, but it also has the chamber operators outside. And they have the gas, the power generator, and anything. They need to keep those divers safe outside. And to know a little bit about the technology of this, you can just see in this video, how important is the oil sector? <laughs> they have diverse safety equipment like this one. In case there is a spill of oil and it gets fire, they can keep cool the boat outside. So, thank you very much. Do you have questions? In saturated diving, I mean, when you're diving this deep, I heard. Like, I have some friends that, you know, that, like, after maybe, you know, a few, like, uh, six years, I mean, their bones become so brittle. Yes. Because of the, all the inert uh, gas that goes. It's a very um, aggressive work for the body. So, after, like, maybe six, ten years, you're just. Yes. You, you re the, these saturation divers, they retire at 35 years yes. old. But they yeah. get paid. A lot yes. of money. And they have valued a de a brain damage also. In this. Yes. But maybe they work only two months per year. And what about like life expectancy? Is that reduced? Yes, a lot. Not the life expectancy, but the problems they have in long term. So they will have osteoporosis, 
uh, and that will have problems in your back, problems in your hips. They have many problems, those types. But it's very well paid. <laughs> yes. yes. I think it's one of the most uh, the paid jobs in the world per day, per hour. They get paid like, uh, I don't have the name here, the number here, but in one month they can get like $300, $300,000 per month. Something like that. So it's both unhealthy to uh, uh, be in a diving environment and then also getting all this money. Yes. <laughs> you go crazy with that also. Yes. <laughs> All right. I hope you enjoy that you get good information today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank this you. has Thank been uh, yeah, just my That's crazy. Uh, very very informative. I hope you will continue that one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Two. Two. <laughs> Two. <laughs> we have one, and the Coast Guard today have another. Oh. Well, for the one that the coast guard has, that's a portable. They have it in a, you can't hit, gaumer. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah.